everyone, I'm Rebecca and this is Lion and welcome back to my sewing room. I am wearing a tiara today because it is my birthday week and so I thought that we should do, <laughs> I was a little lion, do something nice and easy and fun today for my birthday week and do a little Q&A while I sew and or pet lion because now I can't sew. I didn't think that one through. So if you are watching this and you are one of my patrons and it's the day that it came out, it is my actual birthday. If you are watching this on the day that it comes out to everyone else, then it is the day after my birthday. If you want to be a patron and get early access to videos though, you can join my Patreon, which is linked down in the description below. So anyway, I posted about like a week and a half ago or so, two weeks ago, on Instagram and here on my community tab and also over on Patreon, asking you all to send me your questions. And oh my gosh, I got so many questions. It was really cool. Like the last time I tried to do a q and I got like five questions and hey, that was a year ago though. So thank you all for being here and thank you all for sending me your questions. So a lot of the questions were duplicates uh, and like a lot of you asking the same questions. So I'm going to address those all first and then I will try to get through some of the other ones as well. I don't want this to be too, too long though. So I do apologize if I didn't get to your question, but I will either try to answer it via like typing and answer your question or maybe I'll do another one of these at some point if you all want me to. So if you do want another Q&A, please comment below if you want me to do one in the future. Anyway, I think the male's here. So now that Lion has launched himself off to go check on the mail, I will be able to work on my cartridge plating as well. I don't know if it will actually be in frame, but this is a new project that I haven't announced to you yet because that video is going to be next week and I'm starting an 1830s dress. If you're following me on Instagram, you will have seen kind of some sneak previews of this project, but yeah, starting next week on here, I will be releasing videos of my new late 1830s plaid dress. And of course, this is probably the worst thing to attempt to cartridge pleat during this video because it is noisy. So I do apologize for any noise background. It's just me attempting to cartridge pleat. And in next week's video, I will be doing a full how-to of cartridge pleating. So do be sure to check back for that if you want to learn how to cartridge pleat. Anyway, let's get on to the Q&A. So <laughs> I've got my laptop here, so that's what I'm gonna be looking at. So the first question that I got probably most frequently was, how did I get started in sewing or historical costuming slash how long have I been doing this? So my love of history was instilled in me in a very young age from my parents. We were the type of family who would go on vacation to historical sites, not to like beaches or anything like that. So that gave me my base. And then I got into American Girl, as so many of us, I feel like, who do historical costuming kind of got the start there. And I loved the stories. And eventually then I got the dolls. And I didn't ever learn to sew. Like, I think I did make one, one or two outfits for American Girls, and they were not sewn. They were like sticky Velcro type outfits really bad. But that definitely put like the idea of fashion history. I had some of the Tom Tierney coloring books growing up too. So like all of that just kind of started. And then I did theater too. And at some point my junior year of high school, I guess, I started trying to sew. And I sewed a skirt that I still have in my closet. And I sewed uh, Harry Potter robes and skirt. And then I tried my first historical costumes, which were a Renaissance dress <laughs> and a Regency dress that were both probably Butterick patterns, I think, or Simplicity. And I didn't know how to fit patterns at all. So that was interesting. The Regency one, I didn't even have any closures on. It had to be like pulled over my head and just like pushed pulled down. Yeah, so that was <laughs> that was special. And I made it out of sheets and a pillowcase. And the Renaissance one was out of crushed stretchy pan velvet. <laughs> so I've grown a lot since then. And then in college, I got more into theatrical costuming. I have a minor in theatrical costume design. And I was introduced with by one of my friends to Ren Fairs. 
and he asked me if I could make him pumpkin pants in a doublet and paid me a little bit of money that totally wasn't enough now knowing what I know and I made him that but I told him I would only do it if I could also make myself something and tag along. So for the first couple of years of my costuming journey really I did Ren fairs and I didn't perform in them or anything I just went to them dressed up and then I discovered through the internet that people dressed up in other eras as well. I discovered a Catherine Koshka the Cat and also Kendra de Mode Couture on live journal I think at the time or maybe blogs and decided that oh my gosh that was so cool I found out about costume college and I was like oh my gosh I want to do this so the first two costumes that I would call like historical costumes with research and stuff like that I made in 2010 and I made an Elizabethan doublet dress that was semi-historical because I never actually did the sleeves for it and I did a an 1850s plaid dress and that one I felt a lot better about both of them were still you know commercial patterns all the way but I knew about fitting I knew about proper undergarments by then so all of that really really helped and yeah that's kind of where my journey began and it just snowballed from there and now I am addicted and do this <laughs> The next most common question I got was, what is my favorite thing that I've ever made? And that question is almost impossible for me because I feel like it changes all the time. It's almost like every time I make something else pretty, I fall in love with that thing. But I do have a few that kind of keep their places up there at the top a lot. And those would be my child Victorian dress, which I made in, I think, 2016, I want to say and did so much handwork. It may still be the most handwork I've ever done on a dress because all of the zigzags that you can see on here, all of that had to be hand sewn down both sides. So it was a lot. I worked on it forever. Luckily I was unemployed at the time so I had time on my hands. So that one I'm still super super proud of and I really hope that I get a chance to wear it again because I've only ever worn it once for costume college. Oh, that first one, by the way, was a dress from the MFA Boston. So this is my dress. This is the MFA dress. I'm super proud of how I interpreted that dress. And then the next one is my giant turquoise ball gown. And that is from a portrait of Isabella de Bourbon Bourbon. And I just feel like a princess in that dress. <laughs> like... It just feels it so glamorous when I put it on for the first time before I even had all the trimmings and stuff on it. I think it was just the plain ball gown because the first time I wore it was in process. So I didn't have any of the trimmings on when I first put it on. I think I got that wedding dress feeling. I've never shopped for wedding dresses, so I don't know for sure. But the feeling that they all talk about on like say yes to the dress. I got that feeling where I just kind of wanted to cry because of sheer happiness. So that one is definitely special. And I've actually worn that one three times. I wore the untrimmed version to the Victorian Festival while it was in progress. And then I wore the trimmed version with the huge train and everything to costume college. And then I wore the trimmed version minus the train to the Victorian Festival the following year. And it felt like a totally different dress. So <laughs> that was kind of fun, even though it was to the same event. And then my third kind of favorite project is my fairy godmother bustle. There's just something so delightful, I feel like, about this dress. And it is based on an extant dress from the Manchester Gallery? Manchester Museum? Shoot, I don't know the exact name. I loved the original. It, to it told me it was the fairy godmother. And so I wore it for our group of... Disney bustle dresses that we had at Costume College in 2019 and I've also worn it to the Victorian Festival and it's just so delightful and I love all the little half bows so that's my other favorite. Next question is what is your dream sewing project and are there any dream projects that you feel intimidated by? Yes. <laughs> I feel like actually the first part of the question, the dream sewing project, uh, that changes all the time too because I do tend to actually make my dream projects. So currently my dream project is this purple fashion plate, which I plan to make next winter, uh, assuming that I can find all the fabrics. And I just 
Mm, it looks so scrumptious. Like, oh my gosh, I want it. But it's one that's achievable. I know that I can make it, assuming I find the fabrics. So it'll probably be expensive, but I know I can do it. On the flip side, there are dresses like a lot of the 1890s Worth dresses, or frankly, a lot of Worth dresses in general, that I feel like they might not be above my skill level, but they are for sure above my patience and time level, and also probably above my budget significantly, like unattainable. And so those dresses, as gorgeous as they are, um, and there's a bunch, I mean, I don't know that I can even pinpoint just one, but those dresses I know, like, it's just not something that I am going to be able to do because I don't want to spend that amount of time doing that amount of handwork or what have you. So that's why they're kind of out of my out of my league. They're dream dresses that are just never going to happen. Favorite part of sewing and historical costuming, it is the wearing with friends because honestly the wearing of just getting dressed up and like for no reason, that's not so fun. It's hard honestly even to get dressed up just to shoot a video because to me I want to get dressed up and then go have a picnic or have a tea or whatever with friends which has been a little challenging this last year so there's that. The making is just a means to an end. I don't want to wear dresses that someone else has made so like it definitely I do need to make them myself but the wearing is why I make them. Least favorite part of historical costuming uh, or most difficult or frustrating part of costuming is, well, I guess there's twofold. In the actual process of making the dress, I hate cutting slash doing the mock-up. Fitting the mock-up is kind of fine, but like the sheer act of having to do a mock-up first is annoying. And then the cutting of everything, by far the worst part. Like, if I could have someone else do the cutting for me, I would, because... It's so annoying. It takes so much time. You have to iron everything out. You have to just like, ugh, yeah, I don't like cutting. And then as far as the actual like wearing goes, it's the act of like doing your hair and stuff. Like the getting dressed is easy. You know, it takes a little bit longer than modern clothes, but it's, it's still easy. But like, the doing my hair, it just takes a long time. I never know if I'm gonna get it right. I've done hair tutorials and I still mess stuff up. So yeah, doing hair. What is my day job? So my day job is admin. I am an admin assistant. It pays the bills and I like it because it allows me the flexibility to not work on Fridays so that I can do YouTube on Fridays. And also like when I can do singing gigs, um, it allows me that flexibility as well. And we have just literally like this week we are switching to working from home permanently. For the last year I have been working from home half the time and working at work the other half the time and I'm kind of excited to be able to just work from home and not have to commute and be able to play with Lion and Dora and like have, I don't know, like I'm just excited about all that. Do I have any hobbies outside of sewing and costuming? Yes, <laughs> right now it's not been going on because it is theater. So Theater has not been happening for the last year, hence why I've been able to devote so much time to sewing and costuming. But yeah, I do theater ideally not as a hobby, ideally as a profession. Like I actually have a BFA in acting and stuff, so you know, I want to get paid for it. But <laughs> half the time it is really more of a hobby than, than a profession. And I'm really looking forward to getting back to it when it opens back up. Okay, so a lot of you really want to know about Lion and Dora, so I am here to oblige. This is when I need Lion in here, but now he's in the other room. First, let's talk about Lion because he is my firstborn. <laughs> he's older, I've had him longer. And I got Lion in 2017, so he is coming up on his seventh birthday, because approximately they thought he was three when I adopted him. And I adopted him from the Humane Society. 
and he did have two eyes at the time I will talk more about that in a moment but I could just tell like I found him on the website and then went and met him in person and then picked him up and everything and I could just tell that he was the sweetest sweetest dog and that he would be such a wonderful fit for my family my fur baby family he was the first at the time so he was my family and yeah I'm so so glad that I have him because he is my baby uh, so about his eye. Now, if you are squeamish about things that could do with eyes, I guess, or eye removal, I will put a timestamp right here. Go to this timestamp, skip this next section. But a lot of you want to know about his eye. So when I got him, he did have two eyes and he had two eyes for the first year that I had him. However, at some point during that year, and I feel like the worst pet mom for not having noticed it right away but his eye started to get bigger it started to get enlarged and it turned out that that swelling was due to a tumor so we tried various things at first to just make the swelling go away it did not work and it turned out that he would have to have his eye removed I'm so glad that I did because it turned out that the tumor was fully in the eye and so when the eye was removed Lion's tumor was removed so he is healthy and wonderful now and the good thing I guess is that he had already actually gone blind in that eye at some point he may have been blind even when I adopted him because he never could catch food when his eye was removed he just had to get used to the fact that it was itchy because of the surgery and he had a cone on he didn't have to get used to any change in his vision which I'm so glad about so that's Lion and then for Dora, I adopted Dora with my roommate at the time, Emily, a different Emily than you have met before. And we, she really wanted a kitten. She had a cat and she wanted a kitten. And I was like, okay, fine. Yeah, I want a kitten too. So <laughs> we went and we adopted Dora from the Seattle Humane Society. And she was two and a half pounds at the time. She was so tiny. I'll pop up a picture of baby Dora. And she was just the cutest little thing her and all of her sisters were named after Greece characters so her name was originally Rizzo lion by the way came with his name but it was appropriate and he already knew it so I kept it I've loved the fact that Dora has grown up with me because I know her whole history that's really nice whereas like lion was abandoned and then dropped off at the humane society he was abandoned in some random person's backyard and then those people dropped him off and so there's a lot of things that like affect him differently obviously because he has a history that was negative and probably dark whereas Dora is all light and joy and so that's nice and I just feel like I totally lucked out that I got like the snuggliest kitten so yeah I love my babies they are my family and I couldn't be happier I got a few questions that had to do with like lipstick or makeup or skin routine or stuff like that and people commenting on my flawless skin which <laughs> no it's not at all but I will let you know what foundation I use so that you can also make people think you have flawless skin okay so lipstick was the most commonly questioned thing and this is my go-to lipstick this is Maybelline Superstay Matte Ink in the color Pioneer it is fantastic it stays all day like if you have pizza you'll probably have to reapply in your waterline but otherwise it's so so good I love it. it is the best lipstick I've found I also frequently wear the Maybelline Superstay crayon if I want something that I don't want it to stay all day I want it just for a video or something like that sometimes I'll use the crayon and it's also the red color but I don't remember what that color is called as far as like my makeup goes my foundation that I've been using for years is the L'Oreal True Match Liquid Foundation and it is in the color 0.5. I got really excited a year or so ago when they came out with colors below one because I always used to get that line right here when I used their lightest shade and then they came out with a zero and a 0.5 and I'm no longer the palest color. So yay, I'm not paper, I'm just translucent. And then as far as skincare goes, honestly, I use a really big variety of things and it's kind of like whatever Ipsy sends me or that sort of thing. So I am not super like partial to any one skincare type item. So 
try Ipsy. It's fun. You'll try lots of different things. Maybe I can leave a referral code below to my Ipsy. If I can, it will be down there if you want to try Ipsy. It sends you like five different things every month in sometimes a trial size, sometimes a full size, and it's like $12 and it's really fun and it's just like a nice little treat yourself present. So I got some questions along the lines of like, how often do I wear my costumes? Do I wear them every day or do I ever randomly wear them? And as far as the everyday randomly wear them, no, I don't. I do the sort of like vintage style stuff every day. My comfy vintage is what I call it, comfy vintage inspired. And that is great, but costumes are a lot more effort. And to be honest, I don't really want to wear a corset every day. <laughs> so as much as I don't mind corsets, I don't want to wear them every day. So yeah, I do not wear my costumes every day because they all have to go over corsets. I do sometimes history bound, but that's different. Let me know if you want a video based on history bounding. Drop it in the comments if you want like, you know, some tips or anything like that on history bounding. How often do I wear them? I try to make all of my costumes so that I can wear them frequently. <laughs> like it kind of bums me out when I have costumes that have only gotten worn once, like the Child's Victorian one or like a lot of my evening gown type stuff. So I have learned over the time that I've been costuming now, which 10, 11 years, that I like to make things, I prefer to make things that are versatile and that I can get lots of wears out of, which is why I do a lot of Victorian because I find that Victorian is very versatile. Edwardian also, and around here Regency is super popular. So I get a lot of wears out of my Regency stuff. Whereas like my 18th century stuff, the day wear I can get wears out of, but like a court gown, you kind of have to get dressed where you are for a court gown or really for like a lot of evening wear where it's bigger or trains or whatever. So I don't tend to make that stuff a lot. And it's like, I've wanted a mantua for a really long time, but nobody does that era here of early 1700s, late 1600s. And so I have not made a mantua, maybe someday. A lot of you wanted to know favorite books or movies and my favorite book series is Harry Potter so I've had very mixed feelings about it for the last whenever JK Rowling came out as a turf so that's great and now I just feel like I can't love it as much I don't know I'm trying to separate it but it's hard but my other favorite book series is called the Bloody Jack Adventure series by L.A. Meyer and there are I believe 13 of those books and if you have not read them read them. They are so good. They are all based on this wonderful female heroine and they take place in the early 1800s. They're adventure novels as the title will suggest and she just goes on so many adventures. Like it's obviously no one person would ever have all of these things happen to her so it's a little outlandish but I mean oh they are so good and like strong female protagonist so excellent. So definitely check out the Bloody Jack Adventure series by L.A. Meyer. As far as my favorite movies go, that changes pretty often. So there are a few that kind of stick around. Like if I had to just name, I don't know, my top two, I guess, would be Saving Mr. Banks and Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day. Love, love, love both those movies. Definitely check them out. And then my favorite uh, Disney Pixar movie would be Cars, which I think surprises a lot of people. But if you've ever driven Route 66, you'll know why. Or maybe if you watch that movie, you should drive Route 66 because then you'll know why it's so good. And then my favorite costuming movie is probably The Young Victoria. I think that movie is perfection. Like, I can't think of a single thing I would change about that movie except to make it longer and have more of it because it's so good. I mean, the costumes are beautiful. The acting is beautiful. The love story is beautiful. Like, oh my God, the young Victoria is so good, which actually kind of leads me into the next question of what inspires you favorite costumes in movies, or if there's anyone in history whose historical wardrobe I would want to steal. And I get inspired by a lot of things, but I feel like a lot of it is like movie costumes, um, other people on Instagram, 
and also fashion plates and stuff on Pinterest. Those are kind of the big, the biggest ones with the fashion plates being the number one thing that inspires me. I love looking at fashion plates and then I love adding them to my like to make someday list, which is getting longer and longer. So <laughs> we'll see if I ever get through them all. But yeah, definitely Pinterest. And as far as like someone who's historical wardrobe, probably like young Queen Victoria. Like That'd be pretty awesome. Oh, or Sissy. I love, like, Empress Sissy. All of her stuff is so gorgeous, too. And actually, that kind of brings me into the next question, which is the favorite era to wear or make, because Sissy, I think, kind of is in that era, which is um, my favorite is probably the early bustle. Though it definitely is really, really closely followed by the 1830s. And I think it's because I may actually prefer, I don't know, they're so different. The 1830s is so fun to wear. If you have not done 1830s yet, do 1830s. Like I know it looks goofy, but everyone looks goofy. And that is the wonderful thing about it. It is so goofy and so fun and you feel like a little doll. So please do yourself a favor and try 1830s. Whereas the early bustle is like gorgeous and like, glamorous kind of it's not like 1890s glamorous but like it is I don't know just so many ruffles so many bows so many everything and the silhouette is really really flattering on I would say pretty much everyone unless you are naturally short-waisted in which case maybe not the early 1870s those are my two favorites 1830s and early 70s Okay, so those are all of the questions where like a bunch of you had the same question. Now we're getting down to the individual questions and I'll, again, I'll try to get to as many of these as possible, but this video might get really long and I don't want it to be really long. Okay, so Sasami102 asks, was there a time you ever felt self-conscious being a costumer? And honestly, yes, every time. <laughs> That's why I like dressing up as a group in costume because I never feel self-conscious if I'm with a group. Even if I'm with one other person, I don't feel self-conscious. But if I'm by myself, I feel self-conscious in public wearing a costume. Mini Mighty Mina had two good questions. So I'm gonna do both of these. Uh, the first one was, what does your dream sewing space look like? And honestly, it's kind of just like a bigger version of this room. This room is very small, it's nine by 12. I would love a room where like I could walk around my cutting table and also a room that has like a designated shooting space or even a separate room that has like a, a studio shooting filming space where I can film a full length inside because in Washington it's so like you can never know what the weather is going to do outside today I think it's supposed to rain all day and so if I finish a project and it's supposed to rain for the next five days I can't shoot that project so full like just even a wall where I can get far enough away with the camera that'd be awesome her second question was what is your long-term plan for your antique collection and I would really really love to exhibit it I really grew my collection in the last year which you know I guess that would be quarantine shopping and now I feel like I have a big enough collection that it could kind of be its own exhibit at like a small museum and there's a couple of local museums here that have done costume exhibits in the past. And so I want to reach out to them now about potentially displaying my costume collection with them. They'd have to have their own mannequins because I don't have dress forms that are enough slash small enough to display everything. But I think it'd be really cool to have like a whole exhibition of all of the pieces because I want to share them with everyone and it's been great sharing them with all of you here on YouTube but uh, the thing about a museum is that people who aren't necessarily interested in costumes will see them as well and maybe get interested in costumes. Mara Marie asks would you like to be able to make YouTube slash costume your full-time career? Yes, <laughs> I would love to. I don't foresee it happening for a really long time, but even just in the last several months, it has grown to the point where now I can afford to live in my home by myself. So that is super, super awesome. And maybe in a few years, it can grow to the point where it can be my only income. But for now, again, I'm just happy that I have a job that allows me to have one day off a week uh, where I can do YouTube and everything. 
Practical History asks, favorite historical hairstyle? So it depends. Uh, my favorite to wear would be, and probably honestly my favorite to like do just because it's easy, um, would be 1870s. Basically when you have just all of the curls, so many curls, it's heavy. So that's kind of annoying, but it's easy to do because you just pop on some hair pieces and also it looks really flattering and like halo of curls. But that said, my favorite to look at is 1830s because they are ridiculous. Ray Collins asks, do you forever keep everything that you make? Yeah, basically. I have sold like a few things, uh, very little, and there is one more that I want to sell that is super, super ancient. It's this one. I made it while I was in college before I was technically into like historical costuming. And about like a month before that simplicity pattern that was basically the same thing came out. So that was fun trying to draft it myself. But otherwise, uh, yeah, I mean, I've made stuff on commission in the past, which obviously that I don't keep because it was always for other people. But beyond that, I keep everything that I make because I like to wear it again. Curiously Cosplay, hi Curiously, <laughs> asks, which Disney princess is your favorite? Uh, Rapunzel. I love Rapunzel. I love Tangled. I think she's just like, she's so accomplished, but so naive at the same time. And I feel like I, I mean, not uh, that I'm saying that I'm accomplished. I'm not, but I kind of feel like we're, we are similar in that way. <laughs> Launa Artem asks, where's somewhere you've always wanted to go? There's a lot of places because I guess the other hobby that I have that I should have mentioned earlier is I love to travel. And so there's a lot of places that I want to go, particularly like all over Europe. I just really want to go all over Europe. And I was supposed to go to a bunch of countries last year. Oh, well, hopefully soon. But honestly, like the number one place that I have dreamed about going that's like dream trip would be to go to Japan. I really want to go to Japan. Specifically, I want to go to Tokyo Disney and I want to go to Kyoto. And that's really it. Like I, I'm sure the rest of Japan is absolutely beautiful as well. But the idea of going to Tokyo itself scares me because that's a lot of people. And even pre COVID, that was a lot of people. Um, but I really want to go to Tokyo Disney and Tokyo Disney Sea because I'm a total Disney fan. El Zeal asks, how do you find time to sew so many lovely things? A lot of it is that I do work four days a week. So that helps. And normally I fill all of my time with theater. And so I have not been doing that. So I'm used to keeping extremely busy and I don't know how to relax, which uh, if you saw my last video, you, <laughs> yeah, you already know that. So yeah, I just do it constantly. That's how I sew a lot, but thank you. Nightmare has some kind of off topic questions, but I am going for them. Uh, favorite thing to eat when you're absolutely insanely busy. Also favorite thing to eat when you're lazing about or having an easy day. And do I Google recipes or use cookbooks or both? And the main reason that I'm addressing this question is because I, this is totally not sponsored, but I have recently discovered, that's the wrong word. I recently started using every plate, which is uh, one of those food box things where then you, like they send you all the portioned ingredients and you make it yourself. And oh my God, like I feel like a different person from before I started using every plate to now, which literally, I think that was actually what was, what was dropped off earlier. But like just even the first box, those five meals to like after those five meals, I didn't know how to cook before. I didn't know how to cook like meat and stuff like that. I could do pasta and baking and things like that, but I didn't know how to do other stuff. And now I feel like I know how to cook. And in fact, I took one of those recipes that I made in the first box and I made it with like stuff from the grocery store too. And it like, it wasn't quite as good, but I just, it felt so, such an accomplishment. And it was so easy. And they just like send you everything that you need and it's portioned out. And it's like a really good price too, especially like my first, I had some sort of a deal and my first box uh, wound up being $28 for five meals, two servings each. So really that's 10 meals because it's just me. And it's just no brainer. It's a little more expensive now. It's like $48 or something like that, but still so worth it. So 
if you want to try every plate again not sponsored but if you want to try every plate i have a link down in my description below and if you use my link then you get a discount and i think i get a discount so that'd be awesome please do that because highly highly recommend it and as far as like when i'm insanely busy uh one of my favorite things to do that is really quick and easy and this might sound weird but it's cheesy rice and like cheesy rice rolls basically so you take instant rice you cook it up in the microwave you put uh shredded cheese in it i do colby jack but you know whatever your preference is and i do a little parmesan and then i take roast beef and like lettuce if i have it and lay the lettuce and roast beef out put cheesy rice inside roll it up and then like eat those <laughs> i know it sounds so silly i've been doing this since like college maybe and it's delicious highly recommend. k 2 Lar asks, who taught you to sew? Do you still feel their influence on your work? And also, you've grown so comfortable and relaxed in front of a camera over the last several months. Tips for feeling natural talking to technology. So the first question, I'm self-taught. Like I have that minor in costume design and so I did learn a little bit there, but mostly it's the internet that taught me. And so and I, that was pre YouTube. So now you guys have an even better resource. You, like everything is at your fingertips. But yeah, that's I, I'm self taught. And so I don't feel influence on my work, I guess. I don't know. Definitely like I should say self taught by using like people from Live Journal because I am of the Live Journal costume generation. And that was such an amazing resource to like have people to talk to on live journal you can see what they're doing how they did it and everything so that was really helpful and as far as talking to a camera first off I'm an actor so I'm used to just like talking I guess and though I am not an extrovert I am an introvert and I don't know I feel like I just I ramble a lot as you can tell and otherwise my if I'm not rambling my video is probably scripted it doesn't feel like I'm necessarily talking to everyone <laughs> sometimes it feels like I'm talking to myself so maybe that helps but it's honestly not too bad you get used to it the first video was definitely awkward but now a year and a quarter out it's like no problem at all I do still occasionally sometimes look at the monitor instead of at the lens so I try to get better about that but what can you do Okay, just a few more questions because this feels like it's going on for a really long time. Maria Thorning asks, are you interested in history in general or only fashion history? I'm interested in history in general. I love history. I, I definitely follow that mantra of like those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. I think that is very, very true. And yeah, I mean, fashion history is definitely my focus, but I love history. The second part of her question is so important. <laughs> she says I myself am plus size and I feel it can be hugely demotivating to look at patterns that in no way are my measurements and I end up feeling deformed and ugly so I was wondering if this is something you've struggled with yourself and how you overcame it and do you have any advice for me on how to overcome this myself and keep motivation to sew something for myself and that is such a good question and I feel like the key thing is that you can't think of your measurements as in comparison to like oh well this is what they should be but this is what they are no they're just numbers they're just numbers that have to do with what you need to cut out and what sucks is that pattern companies have not gotten to the fact that women are larger now people in general are larger now like those pattern sizes that they're making half of those patterns probably fit nobody i mean i think the majority of people are wearing a pattern size 12 and up because pattern sizes are just so antiquated and the fact that they're not even catering to anyone above a pattern size like 22 or 24 is ridiculous and they need to do better so hey if you're listening and you're from simplicity slash butterick slash mccall slash etc do better <laughs> they're probably not listening <laughs> but yeah it's really just looking at it as a number like if you have to size up patterns you have to size up patterns and it's not a big deal don't make that affect your self-worth at all like you are important no matter what size you are you are perfect the way you are so don't worry about I know that's easier said than done but don't worry about sizing up patterns or that your your sizes don't match the patterns or whatever it's just a number and it does not have anything to do with your self-worth so it's a hard step to overcome in like just 
appreciating yourself for who you are, ignoring the numbers and stuff like that, but it's so, so worth it. So if you can get past that point, I think that you'll find that it's, it doesn't matter the going into it, you know, the sizing up and all that, you want to feel pretty in the outcome. You wanna make sure that you are feeling beautiful in whatever you make. So it doesn't matter what size that is, as long as you feel comfortable and beautiful in it, that's the key. Hopefully that was helpful. And speaking of which, next question from Kinanganklaad. There's a lot of A's in that last name. Uh, how do you feel, emotions I mean, when you're wearing your historical outfits? I feel beautiful. That's the point, right? You want to feel beautiful in them. Yeah, that's why there's some eras that I don't do. Like, honestly, I'm probably never going to do the 1920s. I don't like that silhouette. I don't feel beautiful in it. I feel like it's totally unflattering. But in like the bustle period or I mean 1830s I feel goofy and cute maybe not beautiful but like I still love it but yeah you want to make things that you feel beautiful in that you feel happy in so that's what I do and last question here which I have already announced this on my community tab but I had it was because of this question that I did this. So Rebecca Terrell asks, do you have a PO box for presents from complete strangers who adore you yet? And yes, because of that question, I know that others of you have asked in the past. And so I finally figured it was time to get a PO box. I have reached that big girl YouTube milestone, I guess. So if you want to send me mail, I'll put the address here and in the description also, but it is PO box 695 Auburn, Washington 98071. So feel free to send me things, but also no pressure. Like seriously, don't, don't feel like you have to send me anything. But if you want to send me like a happy little postcard or something, sure. Send away. Okay, this video was probably super, super long. I have not finished my cartridge pleats at all because I'm getting totally distracted. But I think I am about three quarters of the way done. So I will finish these later. And again, if you want to see how to actually do cartridge pleats, that will be in next Tuesday's video where I will be starting this 1830s project and showing you how to do cartridge pleats. So do make sure that you are subscribed so that you will get notified when that video goes live. Anyway, I hope that you liked this video. If you did like this video, please go ahead and click the thumbs up icon. And if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. I do post videos here on YouTube twice a week with my sewing vlogs normally on Tuesdays and other costuming content out on Saturdays. But I post every day over on Instagram. So please go follow me on Instagram. That's at Lady Rebecca Fashions. And if you would like to support all of the work that I do on this channel, I do have a link to my Patreon and my Ko-fi accounts down below. Once again, thank you so, so much for joining me for this birthday Q&A. I hope you have a wonderful week and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing!